Well, a very warm welcome to our service here at uh, Tron Kelvin Grove. It's uh, great to see you all out uh, this morning with us, and uh, great to see some new and visiting faces as well. I trust uh, the welcome team will have uh, greeted you and welcomed you and helped you to feel at home amongst us. Uh, but if you are new, uh, do stay behind afterwards. Uh, introduce yourself to those sitting around about you. Uh, we would love to make you feel at home amongst us. And do uh, grab a, a cup of tea or coffee after the service. There's plenty uh, around uh, the building, so uh, grab some and uh, get chatting to some folk. And we'd love, you to help, uh, love to help you feel at home. And if you are fairly new to us or brand new and you're going to um, come back and visit with us again, then you can uh, sign up on the website to let us know that you are visiting, that you'd like to find out more, uh, that you'd like to be um, connected in with us. Uh, so have a look on the website and you can do that. Our announcements uh, for all that's going on in the life of the church this week um, were on a slide before the service began, and they'll be there again at the end. Uh, so you can uh, look at those um, after the service if you uh, would like. But let me draw attention uh, to just a few of those. Uh, first, uh, we meet again this evening uh, here, uh, well, late afternoon um, at 5 p.m. Uh, for our uh, joint service with all the locations uh, coming together. Uh, do come along to that. And there's provision for children as well. Um, come along, join with uh, the whole church family as uh, Edward Lobb will be beginning a new series in First Thessalonians. Uh, on board, uh, for those who signed up and are keen to be members with us, that begins this evening after the evening service. Uh, so that's just a reminder. Uh, this is a prayer meeting week. Uh, so do make every effort if you can to, to join us on Wednesday evening uh, for half past seven at Tron Central. Uh, we'll... we'll join together to pray for our world, for our mission partners, and for our ministries here in Glasgow as well. And there's, that's one of the most important meetings we have in the week. Uh, do be praying as well for our Christianity Explored course, which starts on Tuesday, um, Tuesday at 7.30. Uh, do pray for those who will be coming along, pray for the team. Uh, but if there are people you can invite along, even at this last uh, minute, then do do that. Uh, make the most of that course uh, where people can get a refresher in the basics or be introduced, uh, possibly, to the gospel for the first time. Uh, so have a think about that. Uh, last uh, thing that's happening in the week is on Friday we're having a, a quiz, a church family quiz. That's really for anyone uh, who's been uh, coming along with us. It's an opportunity for new people uh, to connect in and get to know others in the church family. And it's an opportunity for all of us who've been around for a while uh, to have a bit of fun together and to look out for uh, new people and uh, just to build a sense of uh, the fact that we are a family together. So that's on Friday, and uh, you can uh, sign up for that. Please do on the website again, and uh, we'd love to welcome you along uh, for that. And finally, before we turn to our reading, uh, we have a new book of the season, book of the term, book of the um, some period of time, and uh, it is uh, Confronting Christianity. Uh, so it's uh, 12 questions uh, from a kind of apologetics point of view, uh, helping us to have confidence that actually Christianity does answer these questions, and uh, it'll be helpful for ourselves uh, to have a bit of uh, re restored confidence, to have uh, the ability to engage with our friends on it. But it might also be a good one to, to read with uh, some of our uh, non-believing friends. We've also got one for those who maybe aren't the biggest readers. It's uh, a very similar book. It's basically the same book, uh, but for teenagers. Uh, so if you don't think of yourself as much of a reader, uh, there is uh, uh, an easier read uh, version of it. And uh, one of them is 12 questions, one of them is 10. So some of you might want to buy both and uh, work out what the two missing ones are. The sands of time are sinking, the dawn of heaven breaks, the summer morn I've longed for, the fair sweet morn awakes.
now is the time in our service where we pause to take a few minutes uh, to reflect on our offerings to the Lord, an important part of our worship together. Uh, most of us give online through the bank, and if you'd like uh, to begin doing that, then details will be on the screen, or you can do so at uh, tron.church forward slash giving. If you aren't able to do that or prefer to give in cash, uh, then there are baskets uh, at the door, and you can make the most of those. Uh, but uh, as the musicians play, let's reflect on that or possibly be reading over uh, the words that we'll be studying together shortly. Well, a very warm welcome to those uh, joining us now from other locations. Um, welcome to you, and uh, we're going to, to join together now in prayer again. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace once again to bring to you some of our many concerns for this world. And as we do so, we are thankful that yours is a throne of grace. And it's a throne that we can approach with confidence as your people. And so we bring before you our dear friends Isaac and Gloria. We're so thankful that they were able to return safely to their home to resume their uh, work and ministry. But we are conscious of the ever-growing hostility to the gospel and their ministry that they face. They return with concerns about what Gloria will be able to be involved in and with the ongoing concern about when or if Isaac may face imprisonment. And so we ask, Lord, that you would be undertaking for them, that what has been such a fruitful ministry might be able to continue unabated, and that indeed it might even be strengthened, and that all our enemies' traps might be foiled. Lord, in our own nation, we know that you are the one who sets up rulers and governments, and you command us to pray for them. And so we do bring before you our parliament, reeling, before, uh, reeling from the shocking murder of one of its members who for so long served the people of this country, brutally killed whilst carrying out his duties to serve local people. Lord, we know that holding uh, positions and power on a national level is no easy task. And so we do pray for those who have been elected to serve as leaders in this country. We pray that they would, un they would undertake their responsibilities with humility, knowing that they are but creatures serving under the hand of an almighty creator, and that they would seek to serve and to rule, not with pragmatism and populism, but to rule with justice and righteousness, to lead and to lead well, not to follow the fads of the day. We pray that 
Sir David's example and legacy of opposing abortion may be taken on by many more, that our leaders would commit to genuinely protect those who are the most vulnerable in our society. And closer to home, Lord, we're so conscious of the many in our city who do not know you. We're conscious of the many who've been in contact with us here in our church, searching for purpose and meaning in the mess of this world. And so we ask that you'd be prompting more people to come and hear your voice amongst us. And we pray ahead for this Christianity Explored course starting on Tuesday. We ask that you would be prompting people to come along. We ask that you'd use that course to bring life, to bring eternal life to more and more people. Bless it, bless the leaders, bless those who come along and bring fruit from it that we might praise your name all the more. Lord, we've prayed much for our dear sister Charlene, and so we now rejoice and praise you that she is now at home. We thank you for this great encouragement, for your great kindnesses to that family and to us as a church family. We rejoice that you do truly hear and answer our pleas, our petitions, and our prayers. And so now we pray asking that you would help us that day by day we would be increasingly setting our affections and our minds on your kingdom and seeking by effort and aspiration the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Give us strength for our daily duties of whatever kind they may be and abide with us in all the changing circumstances that we may have the unchanging treasure of yourself. And so grant us the help of your divine spirit that our meeting together now may not be in vain because it is in the Lord. Hear us, accept and answer us, we beseech you. For our Savior's sake, amen. Well, now as we come uh, to God's word, we're going to sing together again, asking for God's spirit to be at work within us. As we sit under God's word, we sing, Spirit of God, our hearts inspire.
good morning, everyone. Do turn with me, if you would, to the passage that uh, we read there, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3. Now, the Christian gospel is always, always down to earth and realistic. And that is the great refrain of the preacher, Ecclesiastes. He constantly is telling us throughout this book to be real, to face facts, not to hide in fantasy. But his message is not uh, just one of cynicism. <clears throat> it's a challenge to undue pessimism just as much as it is to over-optimism. And of course, biblical realism is always the answer and the only answer that can liberate us for the real joys that this earthly life can afford us. Now, the preacher is very clear. This world can never ultimately satisfy us. But the wonderful paradox is that when we grasp that, when we accept that in the light of God's eternal plan for the world, well, then we can be liberated to know and to possess great joys, abundant joys, great satisfaction in this brief life that we have on this mortal coil. But it all hinges on coming to terms with a proper view of time and a proper view of eternity. And we need to grasp that we are in time for eternity. Understand what that means, accept it, rejoice in it, and you will find that it is a path of great blessing, even amid the bafflement of our earthly lives. You'll find a way of believing delight to banish the bitterness and the despair that is so often what marks life in this world. Let's see how that message comes to us very clearly once again here in chapter 3. First of all, in verses 1 to 8, this message is very simple. We are in time. We are creatures of time. We are not controllers of time. Now, this poem is probably the best known passage in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's often quoted, isn't it? Often actually quoted out of context to try and justify some sort of action uh, with the Bible's permission. Those of my generation will probably remember the teenage film from 1984 called Footloose, where the hero, uh, Kevin Bacon, I think it was, he quotes verse 4 here about a time to dance to, to justify their plan to have a dance in the town hall in small town America. And uh, the preacher was the misery guts, miserable killjoy who was leading a campaign against the dancing. And... Uh, He's quoted this verse in rather sort of hoist on his own petard. There is a time to dance. Well, it's good when, when killjoys are, uh, are shown up by Scripture, but that's not really what this list is actually about, is it? It's not a prescriptive list to justify these various actions. No, it's just a descriptive poem. It's just laying out the simple reality of life in terms of the ebb and flow of time. Rather like the opening poem in chapter 1, which was about the cycles of nature. And here it's about human life. It's about the times that we live in. And he's reminding us in this evocative poem that we are creatures of time, but never <laughs> controllers of time. We live inside time. We're trapped by time and by our own times too. So look at the poem. There's seven couplets. Each of them has two contrasting pairs. Seven's the perfect number in the Bible. It gives a sense of perfect totality, all the ebb and the flow of life's <coughs> experiences as we know it. And the point is, we are not in control of any of it. We can't control when we're born, can we? And we can't control when we die either, but there's a time for both. And we react to time. We are not rulers of time. So there are times of creation and construction. There's planting, there's building up, there's bringing to birth. And we ourselves are often engaged in all of these things. And yet also there are times of uh, deconstruction and destruction, breaking down, plucking up facing death, death of people, 
death of things. And that we might have to live through that too. And we need to accept that, don't we? We need to be realistic about it. There will be times of laughter, times of dance, but there will also be times of mourning and of weeping. And that's just life as we know it. And we'd be fools, wouldn't we, to think that we can control that. We can't. We are creatures of our own times. And it may be that our times, our personal times, see much more of the one thing than of the other. My father was born in the 1920s. He grew up during the 1930s, the Great Depression. And there was nothing he could do about that. He knew great poverty as a youngster. There wasn't much laughter. There wasn't much dancing in the 1930s. And then came the Second World War, which he had to live through and fight in. There were very hard times. But those baby boomers who were born after the war grew up in the 1950s and the swinging 60s. Well, there was plenty of song, plenty of dance then, wasn't there? Very different. And then they retired just in time, just before Gordon Brown wrecked the UK's pension industry. So you could retire with a nice final salary pension at the age of 60 or so. And you could live to enjoy all the benefits of modern medicine, have a long life and lots of holidays and cruises and all that sort of thing. It's a great time to have been born and to live. <laughs> Those times are now past, aren't they? And if you're in your 40s now or younger, you'll be working at least into your 70s. In fact, if you're much younger, you'll probably die working because there won't be pensions for your time, I'm afraid. Get real. These are our times. We can't control it. It's the way it is. Now, you can argue about who to blame, but you can't change it. We have to accept that. That's the point. As he says later on in chapter 7, verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. So there are times, verse 6, and uh, first half of verse 5 there, when the pressing need is to accumulate wealth. I think that's what the seeking and the keeping refers to in verse 6, as it does in uh, chapter 5, verse 13. And the gathering of stones there probably means precious stones. Uh, Exodus 25, verse 7 speaks similarly. Well, when you've got a family to support, when you've got responsibilities for, to fulfill, you have to earn a crust, don't you, to keep it all together. But equally, when times of plenty come, there's a time to stop embracing your substance, isn't there? There's a time to cast it away. <laughs> before you leave it to the fool. Do you remember last week, chapter 2, verse 18? You're no good relatives, or the prodigal chancellor, even worse. Likewise, verses 7 and 8 refer to relationships with people, a different kind of embracing. There's a time to break off, to tear away. Well, that can be very hard, can't it? But there's a time to patch it up, to sew together. Sometimes that can be equally hard. And that's true in personal terms, it's true in business terms, it's true in national and international terms too. There's a time, isn't there, to court friendship, to court peace. But also, sadly, there's a time when war can be unavoidable. That's reality, that's human history. The point isn't in the, in the specific detail, the point here is in the totality. We are creatures of time. We're locked in time, and we're often trapped by our own times. We are not controllers of time. And to think we can change that? Well, says the preacher, it's just vanity, chasing the wind. As vain as thinking we can control the earth's temperature, whatever the green religious zealots will be saying in the next few weeks here at COP26. Now, there's no place, is there, in the Bible for pipe dreams, for delusions of grandeur. None of that for the Christian. Life is a rich tapestry. We simply have to face up to that. We have to adapt to real life, not to try and imagine the reality somehow away, as though somehow we could do that and as though reality would adjust to us. It doesn't happen. That's a fundamental lesson that we need to learn. It's very hard, though, to learn for human beings. 
But the preacher's point is that unless we do learn this, unless we get things to a sense of real detachment about life, so that we can live amid this reality, well, then life will be full of misery. It'll be full of a sense of burden, a sense of dissatisfaction. As one wag put it, life is full of misery, loneliness, and suffering, and it's all over much too soon. Well, there's humor there, isn't there? But there's real truth. The world is full of people constantly dissatisfied with life because they want to be controllers of time, of their time. They can't accept that they are just creatures of time, but they are. That's the truth. But we find it so hard to accept that, don't we? Why is that? Why do we seek so much more from life than our time can ever give us? Why do we seek to control time? Why do we feel so frustrated when we can't? Well, that's because although we are in time, secondly, this passage teaches us that we are for eternity. We are yoked to our transience, and yet we are yearning all the time for the transcendent. And that's the preacher's second point here, if you look at verses 9 to 15. We can't help always looking for more, for that lasting gain for our toil, verse 9. And we can't find gain, lasting profit. We can't get control of time, and that is because, as verse 10 says, God has made it that way, do you see? He has given us this business, this burden of lives that are trapped in the ebb and flow of time, the times that go over us, the times that affect us, the times that rule our existence, but which we as mere creatures cannot control. Because God alone is the creator. He alone is the controller of time. We are locked in time, but He is the Lord of time. But more than that, you see, He tells us we must live as those who have eternity trapped in us. You see verse 11. God has made time and ordered time beautifully in all its ebb and its flow. And we live in this world of time, but also, do you see, God has put eternity into man's heart. And that's why we long for the permanent, for the solid, for the unchanging. In other words, for ultimate gain, ultimate profit in life. But you see, that is something outside time. That's something beyond time, of a wholly different order to time. And so we find ourselves intrinsically frustrated and perplexed. We have this... this sort of homing device within us. And that means that we know enough to give us that thirst, that longing for more. We see the beauty that there is in life, and we sense that that beauty must be somehow lasting. And yet we know that it doesn't last, it's only for a time. We know enough to look for more than this world can give us, but we don't know enough to be able to make any sense of it, to find what it is that's lacking. Verse 11 again, see, man cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. And that is the root of the basic vexation in our human spirits. We long for permanence. And yet the world in our time is just passing. We long for transcendence, and yet we are just transient. But it's because God has put eternity into our mortal passing frame. C.S. Lewis called that the inconsolable longing. He says, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we've always seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fantasy. No, it's real, because God made us for eternity. And that explains the tension 
that we feel in our lives. We can't control, we can't capture the eternal, that forever. We can't find that key to life. Look at verse 14. It's only God, isn't it, and what He does that transcends time. Whatever God does endures forever. And we can't add or subtract one whit from that ourselves. And as verse 11 says, we cannot fathom his doings from beginning to end. For us, look at verse 15. Our past has been planned by God. That which is already has been. But our future also is under his control as if it were already past. That which is to be already has been from the perspective of God. But we can't find how to hold on to it all. But he can. He does. God alone seeks what has been driven away. And the implication is he finds it. That is, while we are helpless to control our times, God is still in control, totally gathering up every moment in his hands. Our times are in his hands, as the hymn says. And that's why, you see, as long as we're living, still asking that question in verse 9, what gain is there for my toil? The answer can only ever be frustration and dissatisfaction because we're trying to be what only God can be. We're trying to be the controller of time. And as long as we live like that, life will always be a miserable, frustrating business, an unhappy business, as chapter 1, verse 13 puts it. A burden, as, chapter, uh, as verse 10 here translates that business uh, in the NIV. A burden of unhappiness. But you see, the preacher is not a pessimist. He's not urging us to despair and cynicism about life. He's not like the BBC and all the other news channels that have doom, gloom, and catastrophe all the time. It's quite the opposite. Look at verses 12 and 13. Right in the midst of this, you see, he points us to a very different picture of what life can be. I perceive there's nothing better for them to, to be joyful, to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil, because that is God's gift to man. A way of joy, of pleasure, of satisfaction in the things of this world, even in the passing of these things. It's a very stark contrast, isn't it, to the, the frustration and the vexation of that question in verse 9. There is an answer to it all. There is a way to conquer the tyranny of the times that are fading and, and of the beauty that is passing. But paradoxically, that, that key begins when you recognize that you cannot conquer time. It begins when we come to terms with the fact that we are but creatures, that we are transient and locked in time, and that God alone is the creator and is the transcendent Lord of time. It comes not just when we come to terms with that, but when we learn to rejoice in that. And we live in the light of that reality all the way through our lives. It's only when we recognize that the frustration, that the vexation that we feel within us is something that we're meant to feel and that we always will feel, that that vexed dissatisfaction can actually become for us the road to joy in life and not the ruin of joy in our life. That's the paradox, you see. It's only when we come to see that the innate sense of dissatisfaction deep within us can't and won't ever be resolved in this world of time. Only then will it be resolved. Well, not resolved, but transformed so that we are truly released for a real and a living joy. Our frustration, our vexation lies ultimately in the fact that we are for eternity. Eternity is trapped within our hearts. God has set it there. And that we are trapped in time, that we are creatures of time. But the way of joy, you see, comes when we grasp what that really means. And that's the third thing. We are in time for eternity. 
God has frustrated us with earthly dissatisfaction so that we will find eternal satisfaction. Being creatures of time doesn't mean we're in the wrong place. That's only so if we see this world as the only place. But it isn't, you see. And the creator of eternity and time is calling out to us in time to shed light on us in time. And only that light can make any sense of our lives lived in time. Because only that light can enable us to live in time for more than just time, for eternity. See, the vexations that we feel in life are God calling out to us, urging us to respond to our true destiny. He calls out from within. That's the point made there in verse 14. The inner tension, the frustration that we feel, it's something God has done so that, look, so that people will fear before him. Pain and perplexity is God's megaphone. It's getting our attention. He's saying, look, we're asking why all the time because God wants us to ask so that we'll look up, so that we'll find the only place of real satisfaction in the Lord of time and eternity, in our Creator. Listen to C.S. Lewis again. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You see, the vexation of the human spirit is for a purpose. It's to tell us <coughs> that we are for eternity. And God is at work in us and on us and all around us in time, in this life, for eternity. And time is when eternity beckons to us with its message of glory. It calls out from within us, as we've said, but it also calls out from without. Look at verse 16. I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness. <clears throat> You see, even as fallen human beings, we still have a deep sense, don't we, of right and wrong. We have a sense of justice and of injustice. And so we have a sense of outrage. It's so much in the world that's so twisted. When we read about corruption in high places where there should be justice, when we read about wickedness where there should be righteousness, it angers us. You read about these awful stories of children in children's homes being abused in a place where they should have been protected. Or the elderly in care homes should be being cared for, but have often been abused, especially in this last year. Or when you read about sex trafficking and terrible things that are just ignored by the police or by politicians or whatever, we cry out, How long, Lord, till there's justice? And yet, our impotence to really change this world, it's palpable, isn't it? Even the world's greatest powers can't straighten out the mess in this world. Look at the humiliation of the United States of America with their recent withdrawal from Afghanistan, squandering how many hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of dollars in that ill-fated expedition. We need something more, don't we? Even than superpowers, we need something greater. We need something bigger to make sense of it all. Well, exactly, that is eternity calling. God is calling, and that's what time is for. It's time for hearing his voice and to respond to his voice. And we must do, because not only is eternity calling out to us in time, one day eternity will confront time and bring an end to all time. Look at verse 17. Do you see? There's a time, he says, for every matter, including the work of God's eternal judgment. God will judge the righteous and the wicked. And that time, to end all time, is surely coming. And so the real question, you see, for every single person alive is simply this. 
Will you realize what you are in time for in time for that? The former columnist for The Times, Bernard Levin, once wrote, will I have time to discover why I was born before I die? Well, I don't know if he did, but that is the crucial question. Because if you don't, there is no hope for eternal satisfaction. And indeed, in fact, there's no hope for earthly satisfaction either because of that. Because that is the whole purpose of human life. The whole meaning of our life and our times, all its mysteries and twists and perplexities, the whole meaning is that we might be in time for eternity, to seek God, to find God. But you see, we're so perverse in our hearts, we're so deaf, and so often we can discover His good and greatest gifts and enjoy them in a sense in this life and yet utterly ignore the God who made them and gave them to us. And so God imbues his gifts, as it were, with an inbuilt appetite stimulant of their own, so that to have them and to enjoy them makes us desire more, more than they can ever deliver themselves. It's like eating chocolate, isn't it, or ice cream. You can't just have one. As soon as you've swallowed it, immediately your appetite is stimulated, isn't it? You want more. And God wants us to seek more because He wants us to find Him. That's what the Apostle Paul said on Mars Hill, wasn't it, to the uh, intellectuals in Athens in Acts 17, verse 26. God made mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their allotted periods, determined their times and the boundaries of their dwelling places. He did that so that they should seek God. And yet, he's not far from every one of us, says Paul. You see, we are in time for eternity. Life is for seeking and finding God, finding him now in time before eternity overtakes time. At the last, ultimately, or in the twinkling of, eye, of an eye for any one of us individually. Look at verses 18 to 21. It's chilling, isn't it? But it's real. One of the chief lessons that, that God is teaching us is that we're all mortal. In terms of our mortal bodies, well, we are just like every other beast. Every one of us, all of us will die. Notice five times the repeated all there in verses 19 and 20. All go to one place. All are from dust and two dust will return. See, from a purely earthly perspective, there's no difference in the end between men and beasts, just as there's no difference between the wise and the fool we saw last time in chapter 2. All die just the same way. Now, verse 21, who knows if there's any difference after death? And the answer is, you see, you can't know unless you have found in time the reality about eternity. That what does separate man from beast is the eternal image of God planted in us by God and which enables us not only to look for more but to desire more, unlike the beasts, and to find it, to find that eternal life in time in knowing and loving and in serving the God who made us for himself. And that's what we're in time for, friends. That's what life's about, to lay hold on the eternal world that God has made us for before we are confronted by it, and before the time for finding God is over and the time for judgment comes. For, verse 17, look again, God will judge everyone one day. So let me ask you the question again. Will you have discovered that you are in time for eternity, in time for eternity? That's a real question for you if you are not a Christian believer today. In fact, it's only the only real question that matters. Do you struggle, do you grapple with that frustration, that dissatisfaction, that perplexity? 
Well, listen to God's megaphone. He's calling out to you to find Him, to submit to Him. St. Augustine discovered that after a great struggle, and he admitted, you made, uh, you've made me for yourself, and my heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. But be clear, that's not a search that you have to embark on all by yourself. It's a search that God has already, already embarked upon for you. God doesn't just call out into time from eternity. He invaded time himself. In the fullness of the time, says Paul in Galatians chapter 4, Jesus came. He sent his Son, born into time, to save us for eternity. Jesus came and said, I am the resurrection and the life. I came that you might have life in all its fullness, that true life of God, eternal life, which begins now, before it's too late. God has called into time. God has come into time. So you can't ignore him. That's the way to disaster, to futility, to despair in this world and indeed forever. Today is the day of salvation, says Paul, the apostle of Christ. Now is the favorable time, he says. And that's why you're alive. Now is the favorable time for you to discover that you're in time for eternity, for the new creation. And if you're not yet a Christian believer, well, now for you is the time to find life in Jesus Christ. Before time disappears into eternity for you. But of course, there are big issues here also for every Christian. Because the frustration that we have in this world won't disappear when you find faith. Don't be mistaken. Rather, what happens is that our yearning becomes far more intense. Because the more our eyes are open to the eternal, the more we want from the eternal. Again, it's C.S. Lewis who expresses this so well. In one of his letters, he says that he longs for heaven most, not in the times in this world when he's most miserable, but in the times of greatest earthly joy. He says those times are like the bright frontispiece, which whets one to read the story itself. All joy emphasizes our pilgrim status. It always reminds, beckons, awakens desires, our best havings, our wantings, he says, because our appetite is whetted for more. And that's why you see there's danger there. That's why Christian believers also need the preacher's warning here. And he gives the Christian two very clear warnings. First, don't expect eternity's glorious satisfaction here in time. We're in time for eternity. The best is yet to be. Don't expect more satisfaction from this life than it is possible to have in this passing world. Now, Christians have to accept life as it is in reality. Don't try and live as if it were not as it really is. There's so many things that we're always going to still see as through a glass darkly. Looking at life in time is like looking at the underside of a tapestry. There are lots of loose threads. You can see the picture, but it's distorted. It's blurred, isn't it? There will always be vexation and pain and perplexity in life, even for Christian believers. Our cry is always going to be, how long, O Lord, until we see justice at last? And Christians have to learn believing detachment from all of these mysteries and enigmas in life. And in them, simply to trust God, that God does know and that He does see and that He does control it all for a purpose of His ultimate glory. Although we may never fathom and understand that purpose this side of eternity. Verse 11 again, we cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. But we do know, as Christians, verse 14 is true, that what He does endures forever. And we have to be content with that and trust God. That's what faith is. 
And we're to walk by faith, aren't we? Not by sight. That's so important for us to keep clear. Some Christians are always seeking more from life than life can ever provide. More in their relationships, more from their careers, from their family, even in their Christian service. And God may give all of these things good in their time. And used for the right purposes, of course, they will yield great blessings to our lives. But misuse them as vehicles to give us meaning, as things to give us purpose in life. Well, that will just turn to dust in our hands. It's the same for the, the quest that many Christians have for better and deeper experiences of the Christian life, to get beyond these, these struggles and these battles, to be released into the great blessings and the victory of the Spirit. Because there must be more, must be more than this daily battle. Well, there isn't more. Not yet. Heaven's full experience cannot be until eternity envelops time, until mortality is swallowed up in immortality. And that's why the New Testament is so full of realism about these things. Contentment is the great blessing of our time. I've learned, says Paul, the secret of contentment in every earthly situation, he writes to the Philippians, whether I've got plenty or whether I'm hungry, whether I'm in need or whether I'm in abundant. Godliness with contentment, he says to Timothy, that's the great gain, the greatest gain. There's nothing greater. And that's the message of the preacher here. This life is as good as it gets in this life. Don't expect eternity satisfaction in time. But when we accept that, you see, we begin to see just how good our time really is and all the gifts that God has given to us. And that's the second warning. Don't miss out on this wonderful earthly satisfaction of time for our time, when we are living in time. Don't miss it. It's the same paradox again, you see. When we grasp that the best is yet to be, and therefore when we live in this world with a, a right sense of believing detachment, so that as the hymn says, we sang it last week, earth's joys may be our guide and not our chain, not looking to this world and this time for ultimate satisfaction, that's when we are liberated for joy in our life and for the fullest earthly satisfaction that is possible this side of eternity. That's when we're transformed, as someone has put it, from being unhappy and discontented even in our happiness to being happy and content even in our unhappiness. That's what the Bible means by joy, you see, real joy. It's an attitude, it's a perspective on life, all of life, that sees through always to the glory of eternity and lives in the warming light of eternity even now amid all the perplexities and the pain of life, with all its experiences, whatever our times may bring to us. It's an attitude that takes you always beyond the clouds to the sun that is always there that you can't see. It's like getting in a plane, isn't it, in Glasgow Airport and taking off through the clouds. And you realize, oh, there's a sun after all. I'd forgotten. And you see that sunlight of what we see in the Christian gospel bathes our whole perspective on life. And that is the light of real joy. Look at verses 12 and 13 again. I perceive that there's nothing better than to be joyful, to do good and find pleasure in toil. That is God's gift to man. You see, that's believing detachment. That's godly contentment and joy. Yes, living in the light of judgment to come, doing good, that is fearing God, obeying Him as the Lord of life. But that is living for joy, rejoicing in all God's good gifts because we trust that God is in control, working His eternal purpose. Apostle Paul says to the Philippians, we can work out our daily salvation because we know that God is at work behind it all and in it all. 
Look at verse 22. There's nothing better than to rejoice in what we do, for that is our reward. It's a much better translation. It's the same word as in chapter 2, verse 10. That's our reward, you see. When we see our daily work, whatever it is, what it's for, for what it's for, it's for a present satisfaction. It's for joy in the doing. When we see that, when we, when we don't try and get what it's uh, get out of it something it can never give, when we don't try and pump it for ultimate satisfaction and meaning, well, that's what releases us to live with joy here on earth, to find the pleasure that God has given us here on earth. Some Christians can be terribly miserable and never happy, even in their happiness. Always whinging about something, their job, their home, their spouse, their friends, often their church. Glum faces, chips on their shoulder, no matter what's happening. But God says, be joyful. Verse 12, be joyful. Do good as long as you live. Refusing, you see, to, to rejoice in God's good gifts for our time, the food he provides, the wine he ferments, the livelihoods he furnishes us with. Living joyless lives in the midst of that. It doesn't just make us miserable. He says here, it's a sin. It's failing to see what we're in time for, to live gladly, to receive gratefully every good gift from the hand of God. To not live like that is to be led not by God but by demons. Read 1 Timothy chapter 4. Don't reject God's joy. Israel was sent into exile because they did not serve the Lord with joy and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all the good things that God had given them. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. And some Christians put themselves far away from God for that same reason. Whereas others, who often live through times of great sadness in life, great disappointments, great burdens. Some can live through that with radiant joy shining from their faces. So let me ask you, are you someone who is unhappy even in your happiness? Well, if so, perhaps you're looking for more from this world than this world can ever possibly give. You haven't really grasped that the best is yet to be. And paradoxically, that might be the very thing that's closing your eyes to the bright and beautiful technicolor of all the gifts and the satisfactions that God does have for you, even in this passing world, while you wait for that glory that is still to come. We are in time for eternity. So may God grant us all eyes to see in time so that we'll live lives of fruitful rejoicing before him, not of futility and regret without him. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men. Grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we are going to uh, encourage one another as we sing our final hymn, Come, we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Do stay behind. There's uh, refreshments at the back and at the front here. Plenty of opportunity to meet and greet one another. And uh, do come again and join us this evening at 5. It would be lovely to be here uh, with all our fellowship together.